Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I'm joined again today by the beautiful Emily Carhill. Emily is a very uh, valued member of the Kidney Coach team. You will probably come across Emily if you jump onto our website, kidneycoach.com, and look at the articles. Emily is writing the majority of our new articles on there. Uh, she also answers a lot of the posts on our Facebook page, and you may even come across her in an email because she helps us with that. Emily is a fully qualified and registered nurse she works in the cardiovascular ward in a big hospital in melbourne australia and she's also a qualified naturopath emily thank you for joining us again today um so last time we spoke about diabetes and so we thought we would just hit on the next big comorbidity or co-disease that goes with chronic kidney disease being cardiovascular disease so um Let's follow the same format as last time. Why don't you give us a, um, especially because you're a cardiovascular nurse, so you're going to have so many amazing um, insights into this, which I think would be really amazing if you could share with everybody. So we might dig a little deeper on this because this is your area of expertise in a lot of ways. So why don't you give us a big overview of cardiovascular disease in general because it's so big. And have I got this right? Cardiovascular disease was at one stage the biggest killer of, of um, cause of death. Is that still the case? Yeah. So definitely an important one to talk about. So over to you, Em. Give me an overview of cardiovascular disease. Gosh, it is a very big topic. Um, yeah. It is the leading cause of death in most countries and the numbers continuing to climb. So you know, with all, I guess, that we you know and all the research that we have and the new techniques that we have, the, you know, we're actually not seeing improvements in the number of people with cardiovascular disease. So I guess when we talk about cardiovascular disease, really divided into, into two areas, one part of that is heart disease and the other part of that is vascular disease. So cardio being heart and vascular being our blood vessels. So it really encompasses everything from high blood pressure, to heart failure, to coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, strokes, aneurysms, valve diseases, um, and, you know, and a number of, of other conditions as well. Um, in terms of the risk factors, I guess, of developing cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of them are also well, there's lifestyle risk factors, so being overweight, um, lack of exercise, uh, having a family history of cardiovascular disease will put you at a greater risk, being a smoker, having a, a diet higher in refined carbohydrates or sugars or um, saturated fats, uh, alcohol, and then as well kidney disease. So kidney disease and cardiovascular disease unfortunately go hand in hand. So if you have kidney disease, you're at a much higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And if you have cardiovascular disease, you're at a much higher risk of developing kidney disease. And I think one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, a lot of people with kidney disease aren't aware of, is that your risk of dying from cardiovascular disease is much greater than your risk of dying from your kidney disease. So Very important thing to know. So thank you. Well, let's, let's reiterate that one. Say that one again and then tell us why. <laughs> So if you have kidney disease, you're more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than you are to die from your kidney disease. I didn't so actually that, know. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so really what that means is that anyone who has kidney disease needs to be looking at their cardiovascular disease and reducing these risk factors. Uh, and also, you know, I know that sounds very doom and gloom, but the other part of it is Anything that you do that's going to be beneficial and helpful for your kidney disease is going to then improve any cardiovascular disease you have and also vice versa. That's for sure. So, I mean, it makes it makes sense and maybe we don't need to go into the detail. It's a, a little bit similar to diabetes because obviously the blood vessels running through the kidneys um, and why damage to the cardiovascular system and also the fact that the kidneys are so um, responsible for producing things like angiotensin and all of those sort of things that regulate blood pressure so how that works but maybe just walk people through why there is this um, cross link both directions bi-directional from kidney disease to cardiovascular and cardiovascular to kidney what is it about those two um, systems that makes one um, more at risk of the other 
Yeah. So um, when we have kidney disease, um, we're more likely to have high blood pressure, which is one of the risk factors for having cardiovascular disease. But again, it comes down, um, as you said, to the blood vessels and damage to our blood vessels. So when we have um, damage to our blood vessels, and remember our blood vessels are flowing throughout our whole body, going to every single organ, um, you know, it's not just our arteries, it's our veins, our capillaries, everything like that. So they're really responsible for the movement of oxygen around the body. Um, and also our blood vessels uh, constrict and dilate. And sort of that's one of their functions. And what happens both in kidney disease and cardiovascular disease is we get what's called endothelial dysfunction. So the endothelium, uh, it's like the lining on the inside of your blood vessels. And that's really what's responsible for that ability of our blood vessels to, um, to get bigger and smaller and constrict and dilate and pump blood around the body. And when they become damaged because of um, various things, whether it's that we're not making enough nitric oxide, which is responsible for that uh, constriction and dilation, or we um, have higher levels of, um, I guess, clotting factors in our blood and stickiness of our blood, then we can start to damage those, that endothelial lining. Um, that then can go on to cause uh, plaques from getting stuck in our blood vessels and our arteries affecting blood flow those plaques can eventually break off and go and lodge themselves um, in our brain in our heart in the vessels going towards our kidneys so that whole circulatory system um, is the health of our circulatory system is really going to be affecting both the way our heart functions and the way our blood vessels functions but also the way our kidneys function absolutely um, okay, so knowing all of that, and and I guess I want to just ask this question, you're in a cardiovascular unit, what are you seeing, what is it that you see most in there? Like what is the most common thing that you see and maybe being a naturopath and being a nurse, what are some of the frustrations you see with maybe some of the ways, and I'm asking this because I reckon this is stuff that I'd like our community to know about, what are some of your frustrations with how things are treated um, in the Western medical that might be missed that you think, if man, if we were just doing this in hospitals, we'd have a much bigger impact on our patients going forward long term. So I feel like that's maybe an important thing for people to understand because they're probably not getting that information from their doctors or um, cardio cardiologists and things like that. Um, I think one of the most frustrating things is that I don't see and this is a very generalized comment and I'm not saying that this is all cardiologists yeah. and doctors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm, I don't see patients being spoken to about their um, reversible risk factors. So what I mean by that is their diet, mm -hmm. exercise, the things that they can be doing outside of medication. Yeah. Outside of needing to have a stent put in so a um if they've got a blockage in their heart well let's we'll go in and we'll pop a stent in which will open it up but we won't talk about the fact that the you know how did that get there and what can we do to prevent further blockages from occurring we'll put them on medication we'll put them on a, a cholesterol medication or a statin we'll use medications to lower their blood pressure that's all well and good but it's not addressing the underlying cause so just because you're taking a medication that is lowering the numbers that you're seeing on your blood pressure, it's not actually addressing what's going on throughout your cardiovascular system that's causing your blood pressure to be high, which is then increasing your risk of getting developing plaque or um, getting you know clots in your arteries or developing heart failure. Um, I I see a lot of putting band-aids on on the problem I guess and so that things look nice and it looks like your cholesterol levels have dropped and you know yes your numbers on the on the blood pressure machine have dropped but it's not actually addressing how someone got there and what they can do to to reverse some of that damage because mm -hmm. you know there is evidence with certain uh, supplements that there can be reversal of some of that um, or preventing it from getting worse in the future and that I find incredibly frustrating. Ah, uh, 
you and me both. And of course, we know that some of the side effects, especially of some of the blood pressure medications, is actually to further um, cause kidney damage. So not only are we looking at something where there's a bi-directional risk factor, if you've got cardiovascular disease, you're at much higher risk of um, kidney chronic kidney disease, but a lot of these blood pressure medications, and there are some in particular, we then patients have been put on these with these high risk factors and then those drug medications are contributing to kidney disease and that is definitely my frustration because I see that all the time that people may not have had any changes to creatinine and EGFR have maybe mildly elevated blood pressure that could be treated through everything that you talked about diet and lifestyle and exercise put on these um blood pressure medications and then they end up with kidney disease yes there was probably some predisposition there from the cardiovascular disease but it seems to be that when they go on those blood pressure medications it accelerates that uh, decline now i apologize my dog has a big bone i don't know if you can hear him chomping and licking water in the background so i apologize to everybody it's the only way i can stop him from landing on my lap and totally dismantling our uh, video so <laughs> bear with me um so yeah definitely my frustration to emily so that being said then what are some of the things let's go dig into that more so obviously diet lifestyle exercise i mean it's the same things we talked about in lots of our other videos it's the same sort of things that we want to implement what are your what if you had the floor and you could talk to these patients what would you be telling them to do i think the first thing well one of the first things that I also want to explain is um, that it's actually when we look at cardiovascular disease and particularly when we look at things like coronary artery disease and cholesterol, that it's not cholesterol that's the problem. It's inflammation <laughs> in the body that's the problem. And so focusing on ways we can lower inflammation is going to be doing more for our risk factors and for our heart and our arteries um, than focusing on something like lowering cholesterol. Why do you think that, so, sorry, so, sorry, I interrupted you. I was going to say, why do you think, I mean, I think I know why, and, but I'm going to sound like a conspiracy theorist, so I'll ask you, why do you think there is such a focus on, because I totally agree with you, focus on lowering things like cholesterol when, um, for anyone that wants more information, Emily wrote a great blog on it's not just about having high cholesterol. I've got I've got very high cholesterol, but my particle size is beautiful. Um, and I've got MS, so I want high cholesterol. I want that fat because my myelin sheath is made out of it. But why is there such a stigma Number one around cholesterol, and then I'll come back to some of the studies that have totally disproven that cholesterol is even an issue. Um, and two, why we get so fixated on that as a number and not actually addressing exactly as you're saying, it's the inflammation underneath that that's actually the issue. So what do you think that's about? <laughs> Handball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think part of it is that cholesterol is almost like an easy scapegoat and it's something that we, ha we have. Um, there are, I guess, medications that, you know, you can see if, if someone gets put on, say, a statin medication or one of the other cholesterol medications, that that number's dropping. So I don't know if it's about feeling like there's an easy answer or there's an easy fix. Um, I think the thing with inflammation, yes, we can measure inflammatory markers um, and they're not always measured properly, which I think is why it's, it's sometimes missed. But it's almost like, I don't know, I feel like it gets put in that too hard basket. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, there's probably inflammation there. And I think as well, you know, we're getting more and more research through and we know that it takes, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 years from what's being shown in the research to actually be shown in the um, way medical treatment is delivered, uh, that that I'm not sure if maybe that just hasn't quite trickled through yet. That it, um, it astounds me. Um, you know, I think as well doctors are very busy. They are uh, educated often by um, drug companies um, they don't necessarily have the time to, you know, be on PubMed researching. 
and if they're, you know, told that this, um, you know, I guess this is the answer or this is the way that that things are going to be um, improved. And, you know, yes, you can read a study and see, yes, a statin was given and it may have lowered the, lower the risk and then we can, you know, there's a whole lot of, I guess, a further discussion about different research studies and how they're conducted. But, I, you know, I do always feel like they're coming from a good place. Doctors are coming from a place of wanting to help their patients and, you know, that this is a kind of easy fix. You know, they don't have time to sit down and go through dietary changes and, you know, go through all of those kinds of things. So they're offering what they have. I don't know yeah. if that was a terrible answer to that question, I think, and it was very roundabout, but I don't know no, if no. answer. No, no, I think I think that's right. And it, to reiterate your point, doctors aren't malice in what they're doing. They just don't know any different. And I think that whole inflammatory piece of inflammation driving chronic disease really came, that was um, um, Jeffrey Bland that really has been the forefront of that. And I know that research came out maybe 15, 20 years ago, and it's been around longer, but it's, there's been a big drive with it. And I read a stat that it can take 30 years from new research coming out before it's even taught in medical school for new doctors to have a new paradigm. So it's 30 years. And then we're finding other research. Do you know what I mean? So we're so far behind in the shifts. I also agree with your point that I think the way the medical system works now, and this is just from having lots of patients that are nurses and doctors and um statisticians that work in that field is the medical system now is very much about ticking boxes and you know for the hospitals and things to not feel like they are liable they have to go check and one of their checks is did we put them it's and you would know this one of their big things that they have to do in outpatients are they have cardiovascular disease did you put them on a statin and so there's this checkbox that doctors have to go through and I think like you say they get busy and they're moving patients in and out and you know, that's the fast way of care. And I think when you're seeing lots of patients and, turn, and fast turnover, how can you ever get a proper case history of someone and really understand someone and find out what it is that's driving their disease to have individualised care? And I feel like the Western medical model misses individualised care, which is, you know, what you and I are so passionate about is treating a person, not a disease, and treating the cause, not the effect. And so... Um, I think to add to your answer, I think it comes down to a time time thing. And so that's the fast, easy checkbox, whereas you and I would be like, okay, well, why did this person develop? Is it stress? Are they inflamed? Is it dietary lifestyle changes? Is it, you know, you know all of that sort of stuff. So, um, but I think that's important because I feel like for a lot of people with kidney disease, and it's something I don't know if you've noticed on the Facebook comments, but something I definitely notice is people come in, generally they've they're diagnosed because kidney disease gets picked up quite late you know it's not like it's been picked up early and so they're generally most people stage three by the time they've been diagnosed and and they're coming through that medical model and so they've never had someone sit down and take a full case history and link things up and explain that it was probably inflammation and stress and chronic infections and all those things that you and I know drive chronic inflammation versus just needing to lower cholesterol. Now I want to come back to the cholesterol and let's talk about some of that stuff that um, you wrote in that blog because I, I really want to reiterate the point that cholesterol as a standalone is not an evil thing. There's far more to cholesterol than just total cholesterol. So why don't you walk us through the particle size and, you know, actually cholesterol and how it actually works? Uh, so firstly, to start with, cholesterol is something we need in our bodies. It's incredibly incredibly important. And without cholesterol, we would be dead. Um, <laughs> so it's, it, I think it's always looked at in such a negative light, but we need it for all of our cell membranes. We need it to make all of our hormones. We need it to make vitamin D. Um, so it's got a number of really important roles. Now, in terms of the different types of cholesterol, so if you've had your cholesterol levels checked on a blood test, you've probably seen that it gets broken up into typically um, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. Um, that's generally all the tests that get done. There are a number of other tests that are actually probably more accurate in determining whether cholesterol is a problem, but I don't see them being done 
I'm actually going to say ever. <laughs> um, oh, they're, they're never done unless we, we're running them ourselves. I'd agree with that. <laughs> so the thing with cholesterol is, and I think it's important to know, is it's not the, not the amount of cholesterol that you have in the body. It's the health of the cholesterol that you have in the body. And what I mean by that is um, the size of cholesterol and also cholesterol becomes a problem when it becomes oxidised. And what I mean by oxidised is damaged by free radicals. So we've all got a level of oxidative stress in our body, uh, all of the processes, whether it be metabolism, um, digesting food, making energy makes a level of oxidative stress. It only becomes problematic when for some reason that level is driven up and it's too high or we don't have a lot of antioxidants in our body to balance it out. And so part of what gets damaged is cholesterol in our cell membranes and the DNA and the proteins of, of our cells. So when cholesterol is damaged or oxidised, if you think of it like being a sultana, so we've got our little cholesterol molecule and we want them to be like nice round grapes. Um, so really healthy, not likely to be able to stick to a blood vessel or cause problems. But if we've got oxidised cholesterol, then it becomes like little sultanas and they're the ones that can actually start to stick to our blood vessels. Um, so that, that then contributes to formation of plaque and all of those sorts of things. But they're, you know, what we really want to be measuring when we're looking at cholesterol levels. The other thing about cholesterol, and there was a really good study done um, actually, I can't remember what year it was done in, but it was looking at levels of cholesterol and levels of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So what they found was that people who had the highest cholesterol levels and the highest inflammation levels had the highest degree of heart disease. People who had the lowest cholesterol but still had high inflammation had a higher risk of heart disease, higher risk of um, having a heart attack, stroke, than people who had high cholesterol but low levels of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So what was, I guess, shown from that is it's not the number of cholesterol, it's the inflammation in the body, it's the oxidative stress in the body, and it's the health of the cholesterol in the body that's really important. Uh, and that's why you can't just look at, you know, people will come in and say to me, oh, my cholesterol is, my doctor's worried, my cholesterol is high, and they'll just tell me their total cholesterol. That doesn't tell me anything. Right. So you need to be looking at all of the different types of cholesterol, how much inflammation someone has in the body, whether they've got diabetes or insulin resistance, which is going to cause further damage to the cholesterol molecules to actually work out whether this high cholesterol reading is going to be problematic or whether it's going to be protective. And it's interesting too, I don't know whether, and I, I know that study, there was another study done to show, and there's a great show on Catalyst, which is an Australian program maybe 10 years ago now, where they debunked um, the cholesterol myth and it's been taken off TV, interestingly. But people with higher cholesterol, as long as they don't have the high inflammatory markers, live longer. So high yeah. cholesterol was actually indicative of longer life. Um, again, with as long as they didn't have the high inflammatory markers, but yeah, cholesterol is protective. It slows down the aging process as long as those cholesterol molecules, as Emily's saying, look like grapes and not sultanas. So you actually want your cholesterol molecules to be fat. That's the only time we we want them overweight in a sense. It's those big, big cholesterol molecules can't pass through the the blood vessel walls so easily and cause damage. Whereas those little sultanary ones, which is a great analogy, you've not heard that. That's brilliant. That stick to the wall and shrivel and they pull other bits of cholesterol to them and they sort of form a great big mass whereas these big grapes don't they kind of bump off each other and they're nice and healthy so definitely one of the things I do in clinic now if someone comes in and says I have high cholesterol and there's a risk of cardiovascular disease in the family I see this a lot I will run a particle size and we'll look at and then we're looking at um densities the density of the the particles basically and then if someone has a lot of low density uh lipid lipotropine cholesterol then we'll treat that and we'll, then you know exactly what formulas to use to versus if they've got nice big fat healthy cholesterol molecules which is what mine looks like so I don't mind that my cholesterol sits high because my molecules are nice and fat so <laughs> so so I digress there with the cholesterol part but I feel like that was a really important part because it it goes so hand in hand with the cardiovascular disease and as I'm sure you would know most of your cardiovascular patients will be on statins oh. Yeah. Whether they have 
Sorry, what was that? Whether they have high cholesterol or not. Yeah, yes. And that's the other thing, right? Thank you. I see this too. Even if a patient doesn't have high cholesterol, but they've got cut, they've had maybe some stents put in, or they've had a myocardial infarction, anything like that, the rule of thumb is they go on blood pressure medication and statins, even though the blood pressure is not high. And here's the scary thing: a, um, cholesterol levels less than two increases the risk of suicide and depression through the roof. In fact, people with total cholesterol under two, the suicide rates go up by about tenfold or something like no even more than that maybe 40 50 percent you'd probably know more than me but it's scary so yeah so anything else you want to add to that emily and then we'll, we'll tidy this up with cardiovascular but anything else you want to add with that or how you want to bring cholesterol back around to cardiovascular disease um I think it's, I, you know, just that point of looking at the whole picture um, that it's, and it, you know, it's not just about cholesterol. It's not just about inflammation. It's not just about oxidative stress or blood sugar. It's about all of these things. Um, and I think that's probably, I was thinking about it when you were talking earlier, one of the other reasons why um, patients, you know, within Western medicine don't necessarily get looked at in that holistic view is because, doctors are trained in a specialty, you know, that's how they work. So if you have cardiovascular disease and you have kidney disease and you're also a diabetic, you're seeing a cardiologist, a nephrologist and an endocrinologist who are looking just at their area of specialty. They're not looking at how each thing is interacting with each other and how it's all connected. Uh, so, you know, I guess that's one of the things about naturopathy that's so fantastic and people who do see naturopaths is that they have someone who's looking at their entire health and looking at and how each area is affecting each other uh, and I think that's probably you know one of you know the most important thing you can do because we know that you know as you said stress is going to be playing into it um, your diet's going to be playing into it exercise your um, hormones all of those things that needs to be looked at all together yeah yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that's when we get that, when we're not, you know, the sum of our parts, we're a whole being that works um, synergistically and integratively together. And you can't just be an eyeball or an ear or a pancreas or a heart, you know, it, the whole thing, the, the one affects the whole, we're holographic. So, you know, if you have a bit of stress or even the way you think about yourself or what food you're putting in your mouth, that has this, um, effect on the whole system and it's looking at that so quickly top tips for cardiovascular disease maybe a couple of your favorite herbs and then some diet and lifestyle stuff yep um so i guess diet and lifestyle probably starting point is uh exercise mm. and maintaining a healthy weight um it's really important because we know that they reduce the risk um, and then also because there is such a big link as well between diabetes and cardiovascular disease, monitoring and maintaining healthy blood sugar levels as well. And then managing stress, getting enough sleep, um, addressing sleep apnea as well. I think sometimes that gets missed a little bit. That's a really big risk factor for cardiovascular disease as well and for worse outcomes if it's not addressed. Mm -hmm. Then supplement-wise, um, one of my favourites uh, would be omega-3 fatty acids. So that is, you know, probably one of the ones that Western medicine is a bit more aware of the research in, so I do sometimes see very occasionally um, my patients have been put on omega-3 fatty acids from their doctor. Right. But, um, you know, really important in terms of inflammation, reducing how sticky the blood is, so reducing the likelihood of, um, you know, blood clots and plaque adhering to walls. And it's also in some studies actually been shown to reverse some atherosclerosis as well, so that hardening of the arteries um, so, as well as preventing it. Then Don Shen is probably one of my other favourites as well, just 
from the way that it works on the heart and the cardiovascular system, um, our blood vessels, but then also being really protective for the kidneys too. And one more would probably be magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, magnesium has heaps of benefits in the body, but it's also got a real affinity for um, the heart and blood pressure and inflammation and the way our blood vessels function as well. Yeah, and it's the first nutrient we chomp through when we're chronically stressed. It's the first one that gets depleted. And I think you and I next will talk about magnesium because it is, it's probably the nutrient that I use the most. And I also want to add beetroot. You mentioned NOS before, nitric oxide. One of the fastest, simplest, cheapest ways to get your nitric oxide up is to have half a beetroot a day. I love beetroot. <laughs> I use it all the time for nitric oxide health. I just juice it. If you're following our um, kidney disease solution program, you'll see that we have uh, juicing recipes in there. And I'm sure we've got a um, cardiovascular one that it'll include beetroot. And we don't have too much. It can be very stimulating to the liver. But quarter to half a beetroot a day keeps a doctor away. Well, I'm not sure, but it's very good for nitric oxide levels, which, as Emily mentioned, keeps the health of the endothelial cells in there, which is your constriction and um, dilation of the cardiovascular system and its ability to respond to that. So, <laughs> Perfect. Well, Emily, thank you. I think that's given us a bit of a big overview. I know I got us a bit sidetracked with cholesterol, but I feel like that's a topic that I wanted to talk about because I feel like that is such... Uh, it's got such a black and white way of it being looked at in the medical community and I really just wanted our, our um, kidney coach community to be really aware that there's far more to cholesterol than meets the eye and that, you know, I've always, I've often got clients that have been on long-term uh, blood, uh, long-term statins and their um, cholesterol's way too low, which means I know that they're not producing enough healthy fat, their vitamin D is going to go down, and that actually increases the risk factors for um, things like kidney disease. So um, it's really important to make sure that you're aware of this stuff and that you can have these really robust conversations with your doctor. And if your doctor's not open to looking at it, either finding another health advocate, I think, and again, um, we can maybe do another video on this, but I think it's really important to have uh, be surrounded by people that support you and advocate for you rather than not listen to what you'd like to, to do. You ha really have to become educated and take charge of your own health um, these days, which is what this whole kidney coach community is about. So if there's anything you want to hear particularly, just drop in the comments below. If you wanted to reach out to Emily, if you're following the Kidney Disease Solution Program and you want to refine or you just want her to look over it, she's the only, apart from Duncan and myself, she's the only trained um, uh, beat kidney disease solution or the kidney disease solution coach in the world so i'll put a link in the notes below emily is more than happy to review medications and just um, check there's no interactions and very happy to break down your blood tests and tell you what you need to have looked at if that's something you want to hand with um, and yeah don't forget to hit subscribe and um, you'll be notified whenever we have more content coming out. So, Emily, again, thank you for your time and just the way you explain things. I'm going to remember the grape and sultana uh, analogy now. I'm, I'm stealing that one and I will credit you in my notes to my patients. <laughs> All right, guys, take care and we'll see you next time. Bye.